coverage of the Rolex 24 at Daytona on David Land is brought to you today by our supporters on Patreon. Well, the 61st running of the Rolex 24, as it usually does in recent years, failed to disappoint. This was just a fantastic race, exciting from start to finish. A little bit of a different flavor than it has uh, been in years past, or at least recent years past. It was much more of an attrition race, at least in the top class, racing for overall victory. But at the end of the day, uh, four of the five classes came down to the last lap, and uh, you know that's, I guess, kind of expected for this era of the Rolex. So. Before we really get out into the weeds, let's take a look at the drivers and teams that won the 61st running of the Rolex 24 at Daytona. And it was overall and in the GTP class. Meyer Shank racing with their Acura ARX 05 or 06. The last one was the 05. This one's the 06. I'll get that right by Sebring, I promise. Uh, but it was, and we'll get into it, a very, very eventful day for Meyer Shank racing, but also a dominant day. Proton Racing, in literally the last 100 yards of the race, won in LMP2. We're going to be talking about that fantastic finish in this video. Uh, the AWW Duquesne ended up winning in LMP3. That car won, uh, was 13 laps ahead of the second place running car. The only class that really attrition was a major factor. Heart of Racing won GTD AM and won overall in the GT division. And WeatherTech Racing, uh, run by Proton Competition, Proton doubling up uh, in two classes, winning in GTD Pro. So essentially, I just need to go through every class because I have a lot of notes, a lot of thoughts on them. Uh, the first thing is GTP, and the GTP winner being Acura, I think is something that nobody really expected. I mean, I think most people thought most of the GTP cars would suffer reliability issues. Um, some folks even were predicting an LMP2 overall win. But the, the reliability, particularly from the Acura, and particularly with some of the issues that they had, uh, and the fact that the car maintained pace is just unbelievable. Uh, there were scheduled stops. Uh, there was a, an issue, uh, and apparently an issue with several of the DPI cars, not just, uh, or the GTP cars, not just um, with Acura, uh, but a lot of the teams had to drain the oil uh, at regularly scheduled parts of, of, the, uh, of the event because there was fuel and oil mixing, and, and that's not a very good combination. But to add to that, the Meyer Shank Racing team uh, had a gearbox issue. Apparently from lap 200 to the end of the race, the gearbox was not operating properly. Michael Shank even said in the post-race press conference that they essentially decided that they were going to run it until it blew up, and it never blew up, and in fact was the fastest, most dominant car. And you think about Tom Bloomquist, you think about Colin Braun, you think about Helio Castroneves and Simon Pagano, and just the, the level of driving that took place today. Not just the car, but uh, fantastic. I mean, I, I think we saw some of the best driving stints uh, we've seen at Daytona in a long time just out of the Meyer Shank racing car. It's also historic because it's Elio Castroneves' third Rolex 24 win in a row. That has not been done since Peter Gregg did it in the 70s. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about uh, in GTP is just the, the sheer pace of the Meyer Shank racing car was defined by this. They were a team that spent more time in the pits than any car that was competitive in this race. They made more pit stops than literally any other car in this race. They made up all of the difference in the race on the race track and come the end of the race where I thought it was going to be a battle between them and the Wayne Taylor racing Acura. Of course, both Acuras making it to the finish and finishing one, two. I thought Felipe Albuquerque was really going to have something for Tom Bloomquist at the end of this race, and it just wasn't that. Uh, it ended up being, what, a four or five second lead at the end. Uh, the pace was there for Meyer Shank racing. LMP2, Proton racing, w beating the, uh, the CrowdStrike car by literally inches. Uh, you're going to see that replay uh, shown quite a bit. Uh, throughout the course of this year. One of the best finishes I've personally seen at the Rolex 24 for a class win. Uh, and it's really important to note that not only did Proton double up by winning in GTD Pro and LMP2, 
but Proton is going to be a team to watch later on in this season. They're going to take delivery of a Porsche GTP car and they will be moving up into the top class. They are a top flight operation as evidenced today and I think that they, as we continue our coverage of the IMSA series, will be a story to watch uh, racing for overall victory. And finally, uh, or a couple of final thoughts on LMP2. There was a lot made about the performance uh, changes made to LMP2, particularly in horsepower. Uh, it sounds like around 100 horsepower has been taken away from those cars. Uh, many of the teams hardly using any traction control at all on the cars. And I think when you look at that finish, not only did you have a roadblock LMP3 car, but you also had the lack of horsepower and thus the drag punching a huge hole in the air. I think that was what allowed the Proton car to get that huge run at the end of the race and end up stealing the Rolex 24. GTM. I guess we're kind of getting into a point of where, uh, or a habit of uh, GT Am cars winning overall in these uh, IMSA races. We, of course, remember the Gradient Acura winning overall at Petite in the last IMSA race we covered back in October. And this time, it's the heart of racing Aston Martin. Now, the Aston Martins were really one of the best uh, BOP cars here. Them and the Mercedes were definitely, I think, the, the, the fastest cars uh, as the rules currently are structured. And uh, it ended up paying off. And speaking Speaking of Mercedes, GT Pro, WeatherTech Racing, which is run by Proton. Uh, the, the story there is that Cooper McNeil, who is the namesake uh, to the WeatherTech company, uh, is uh, going to quit professional racing or is at least going to take a step back from it. He wanted to win the Rolex 24 his entire career. He did it in his last race and probably dropped the mic and retired in victory lane. The other couple of things I'm interested in with uh, GT Pro was the absolutely fantastic battle there at the end of the race. Um, obviously, the teams aren't necessarily running for overall in GT. They don't really care about that. But the fact that the Windward car was in there, the Heart of Racing car was in there, and then you had the Lexus and the Corvette. And I really want to give a shout out to Lexus because I think they were super hampered by BOP, and yet they were in there in the running and really probably should have had a much better chance of winning this race towards the end. I just don't think they had the rules quite in their favor. And the final thing, LMP3, not much else to note about uh, that other than the Dukeen one, and it was really the attrition race in LMP3 that we thought we were going to get in GTP. Uh, a couple of other news and notes uh, from this race uh, that I just kind of want to touch on really briefly. Uh, the only GTP car not to finish the race was the number six Penske Porsche. That had a gearbox failure and an MGUH uh, failure. I guess those two uh, parts are connected in some way, and that was why you saw the big smoke. It was kind of interesting to see that car drive itself back to the pit lane on electric power only. Um, I also think that IMSA needs to pick. Uh, one amateur prototype division. I don't think we need two amateur prototypes divisions. I think you need to pick LMP2 or LMP3 and make that uh, the place where the amateurs can go race uh, prototypes. And I think if you looked at the show today, just based on, solely on the show, you'd probably keep LMP2. But I think from a technical standpoint, LMP3 is a little more interesting because at least you have chassis competition there. And also, GTP looks like an absolutely awesome class, and it's going to be awesome going into the future. I think IMSA has set itself up very nicely uh, for the future of motorsports. And when you look at the crowd today, uh, there's been a lot of claims that it was the biggest crowd in Rolex history. It's very, very tough to, to say that uh, as a fact, but I will say it's the biggest crowd I've ever seen here. And the fact that the grandstands going down into turn one of the road course were, you know, probably 75% full in Daytona Rising, you know, that's, you're, you're talking 30, 40,000 people just in the grandstands uh, for a sports car race. I think that is extremely important. I want to bring in a friend of mine and a co-worker of mine, uh, Kyle Cuthbertson, because uh, I always like to hear Kyle's thoughts, and believe it or not, he really, really helps um, with a lot of our points and a lot of the things we kind of observe throughout these sports car races. Sometimes he'll notice things that I'm not noticing and it's a really big contribution uh, to the broadcast and to what we do. Yay. Yay. All right. All right, Kyle. Uh, give me some of your observations on this 24 hour. Uh, I always appreciate your contribution. So what did you see that I didn't see in this one? Um, well, I pretty much saw the same thing you did on the race, I would say. Uh, I mean, it was just back to old school endurance racing where yes. cars were, you know, finishing like the lap, lead lap cars were one and two and then third place on back were having issues, maybe one, two, three laps down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when I think about it now, uh, 
really, the way to, you know, based on IMSA and the, and the safety cars and getting laps back, like, that doesn't normally happen, uh, this race would have been two cars in the lead lap at the finish. Yeah, yeah, because the Wayne Taylor car got a lap back really, really late, um, but obviously they proved they had the pace to be up there anyway. Um, but uh, you're, you're right. I mean, it, you know, we kind of looked at the pit the pit lane delta, or uh, at least the pit lane time throughout yes. this race, and I think Meyer Shank had 10 minutes more pit stop time than the, the, the next closest Cadillac. Yeah, and like two minutes more than the uh, Wayne Taylor Acura. Yeah, and so just add have, that and think about that as a margin of victory if they don't have those pit lane problems. More times than any car in the field. Yeah. Including ones that had crashed or had trouble, you yes. know, it, that that to me was unbelievable, unbelievable. And the other thing I, I enjoyed moving on. The, <laughs> other, thing, the other thing that I enjoyed uh, about this race was, uh, you know, like we didn't even know until the press conference, but Meyer Shank actually had a, a gearbox issue throughout that, yes. the night, and it kind of makes sense now seeing because I he went to sleep. Uh, I, I I I slept for two hours last night, so I think I slept for four. Be very unorthodox. <laughs> I will speak terribly. I'm sorry. It's the best. But, uh, that's why. We, that's why we love the Rolex. We love the chaos. We had I, Bucky the Beaver on last night. Yeah, I, I played a, a, a pu I puppeteered a Beaver at 1 a.m. Spoiler night. alert. What? Oh, come on! You just ruined the illusion for all the kids in the audience. It's terrible. I have. I've slept for two hours in the last like 48. Gearbox. <laughs> but uh, it all makes sense because in the middle of the night last night, I remember there was a point around 5 a.m. where the shank car didn't even make it for the. Uh, where they uh, let the the, G, the classes yes. get together, so they, they ended up re restarting behind the entire GT field, and so it kind of makes sense that they've been coming into the box. But uh, it's just things like that. Or uh, they had a gearbox issue that we didn't even know. That car could have straight up Toyoted, and yeah, shut down on the last lap of the race. And, and we know from speaking to some people within that team that the the optimism was not there they were very pessimistic and even my michael uh shank said in the in the post-race press conference he thought there was a five or ten percent chance that they were even going to finish this race not much not much less dominated in the fashion that they did have to come from the back so many times i mean colin brown and uh tom bloomquist and simon pagino some of the drives that they had in traffic coming back up through the field because of those hamperings with the pit stops. I mean, it, this was spectacular. I think every all four drivers on that team had at one point in the race uh, a moment that won them the race. I think all yep. four drivers they all had moments where you know they really they I think overnight they came from the sixth or seventh in, in class to first on six or seven different occasions, different restarts. Uh, all different drivers did it too, and it was it was amazing to watch. Uh, I was telling you, at, by the end of the race, if Shank lost this thing, that was gonna be a heartbreaker. Yeah, yeah it the was. Story, the story really became like, it's not whether or not Shank's gonna win this race, it's if they're gonna lose. Yeah, And that yeah. would've been the story. Yeah. Um, kind of like how Ganassi's been the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Both, both here and at Indianapolis, in some ways, at least until last year. But uh, yeah, no, this was. I think this is a historic one. I guess the final thought from you. I, what do you think about GTP? I know, I know, we've kind of been back and forth on on how we feel about it. I, I feel it's. It, it, it feels a lot more old school to me. It doesn't quite feel like we're watching an, a 24-hour Indy Lights race. It kind of feels like the Rolex 24s that I grew up with, where you're really not sure you know, who's going to be able to make the yeah. finish because of the new technology and, and how we're still kind of learning how to deal with batteries and, and electrification and how to best, uh, you know, how to quickly repair cars that have damage. But at the same time, I, I kind of thought it was refreshing to have that uncertainty all the way up to the last lap even though if shank was leading by five seconds you kind of go oh my god you know they it, that thing could just grind to a halt and they'd lose what did you think yeah, of gtp I mean, the, the nbc booth for years now during dpi just pounded into your head this is a 24-hour sprint race well this year it really wasn't mm -mm. you had guys not using curbs for the first you know 23 hours mm -hmm. uh just to save equipment i i love that i think that's yep. that's what this race should be about uh it's Everybody has a different car, and everybody, they don't know if it's going to last. And that's exciting as a fan, because even if they're spread out and the racing's not really that exciting, you know, all of a sudden a, a Porsche blows up. Oh, yeah. and, you know, this car, is, they're going in the garages, uh oh And that so sort of like, thing can tighten the field, too. Yeah. You know, that's, if it runs for green five hours and it gets spread out, 
just one car blowing up. And that's what I appreciate about the manufacturers who have come here. They're taking a risk yeah. because, frankly, it, look very silly. It, it was kind of embarrassing for, for Porsche. Yeah. They have the most mileage on that particular type of car, though, as I understand that their cars that they were running today are fairly new. You know, you have a lot of data on that engine. You have a lot of data on that chassis. It's amazing to me that they, they were the worst team here, Porsche. Yeah. I could, if you'd asked me that before we got here. Technically, they were the only only team. Only like DNF. that had a DNF. Only DNF. Even BMW got to the end of the race. And um, it, that's, that's spectacular. That's really crazy. And when you think about Roger Penske and his goals for this year, I think Roger wants to win Le Mans. That was not a Le Mans winning performance today from Porsche. And um, it's, it's kind of ironic that the car that's not going to be at Le Mans this year won this race. Yeah. And I hope that Honda Global looked at that and said, hey, wait a second, we've got something here. Let's go and let's bring Meyer Shank Racing. Let's bring Wayne Taylor with Andretti Autosport. Why not? These two teams would be I mean, competitive. They, in the press conference they just had, they made a statement. We've won Daytona, we've won the Indy 500. We didn't expect to win them that quickly. Uh, next up, what that, do we have to win I think, tomorrow? I think that's a sign. I think that's a sign. Hey, Honda Global, hi. I Take him to Le Mans. Uh, yeah, you know, because your car is pretty fast in a straight line, guys. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it is. Well, let's just wonder if the ACO would would just completely knock them down. We'll have to see. Honda might be playing really smart here because we don't really know how LMDH is going to balance with uh, LMH. So there could be a, you know, they. Porsche could not be competitive, you know, BMW might not be competitive, Cadillac might not be competitive, and then Honda might say, well, at least we can win an IMSA. So, I, I don't know. Anyway, I think we've rambled enough. Yeah. I think you want to go to bed. I want to eat and our then week, go to bed. Our week started with karaoke at Applebee's. Yep. It, this race started with Spider-Man. Yep. And then it ended with, with Spider-Man. Spider it's, <laughs> it's themed. I'm covered in champagne. Yep. <laughs> I've slept for two hours in the grandstands. It's time to go to bed. So, on that note, um, I won't be at the thermal test. I couldn't make that happen. Uh, you know, at some point you have to choose, do I want to go to Long Beach or do I want to go to the thermal club? And you guys have already seen that on my channel. I'll still do virtual coverage, but I won't be able to attend that. I will be going to St. Pete. I will be going to Sebring. I'll be going to most of the IndyCar races, most of the IMSA races. You'll be there for about half of what I am, I think. And so... Uh, and yeah, follow Car Chaser. Yeah, because that's what he's going to be. That's that's his full time gig, believe it or not. So, thank you guys for supporting my Rolex 24 coverage, uh, and uh, thank you for supporting what I do. I mean, I, I met so many of you guys uh, this weekend, and it just was so it's so humbling and fantastic to to, uh, to to feel like I'm actually doing something in motorsport, believe it or not. So, thank you guys for watching. I think we all need some R and R, and we'll see you in the next video.